Hi, everyone. I'm Raj Kumar, president and editor-in-chief of DevX. This week, we'll be breaking down the big headlines in global development and bringing in some top experts to help us do it. If you want to follow along with the stories we're talking about, check out devx.com and subscribe to our daily newsletter, The Newswire. There's a link in the description. Follow us along on Twitter, and you can see many of the stories we're talking about today. And we'd love to hear what you think. This is This Week in Global Development. I'm joined by my colleague, Rumbi Chakamba, who's an associate editor here. Hey, Rumbi. Hey, Raj. How are you? I'm doing well. Nice to hear your voice. Uh, Rumbi yes. is based in Botswana these days, right? Yes, I am. And it's nice to hear your voice as well. Well, you're coming through loud and clear, and we are really thrilled to be joined by a special guest, somebody who this audience probably knows very well if you read DevX regularly, and that's Patrick Fine. Hi, Patrick. Well, hi, Raj. So uh, great to hear your voice, too. You uh, I, you wear so many hats, but I know you're a non-resident senior fellow uh, over, at the, uh, over at Brookings in the Center for Sustainable Development. And of course, you were the CEO of FHI 360. You were a vice president of the Millennium Challenge Corporation. You've been at USAID. You've been a around the block, let's say, in the global development world, uh, spent 20 years living in Africa. So it's so good to get you to get you to join us this week. And maybe given all your experience, we could just kick off with a story that we published this week on USAID's spending. Um, we had a piece written by our colleague, Miguel Antonio Tamonan, who talks about the $38 billion that was spent through the acquisition and assistance mechanism uh, in the last fiscal year. And he kind of tries to break down sort of what it all means and where it went. Uh, did you have a chance to see that, Patrick? And I, I would love to hear your kind of high level take on what you think USAID is doing these days. What is it doing right? What is it doing that could be improved uh, when you think about some of the big trends in development it's trying to respond to? I did get a chance to look at, at that article. And it strikes me that USAID is um, kind of in a... Uh, holding pattern right now. Um, if you look at the spending, it's pretty much consistent with where the spending has been going for a long time. The, you know, most of the spending, most of the funds are allocated to health programs, and then you have and, and now increasingly to humanitarian assistance. So you see that as a major trend in um in international development is the rise of demands for humanitarian assistance as we see these multiple crises um, around the world. So I, I see a shift of funding more to the humanitarian and crisis response side. I see a kind of status quo with continuing to be the predominant um, bilateral funder of global health programs and then the you know balance of the funding is um, is is divided amongst a, a whole bunch of different priorities, everything from democracy and governance to education to um, civil society strengthening. Yeah, I think that your point about the humanitarian numbers uh, really came out to me too, especially if you look at Ukraine and how big it was as a part of this budget. And it does seem like that is a a longer term trend, you know, that we're, we're just in a different era where the number of conflicts, the severity of them, especially given the geopolitical situation today, and the growing climate crisis that USAID and other bilaterals, they're just going to have to spend a larger and larger share of their total budget on responding to emergencies. And does that sound right to you? It does. And it, um, when I look at the the environment right now for international development and for U.S. global engagement. Um, the question in my mind is whether the the institutions that we have, you know, the bilateral donors, including the U.S., the U.N. system, the multilateral financial institutions, whether they're really up to meeting the extraordinary challenges that we're seeing on the world stage today. Like you mentioned, Ukraine, there's Gaza, there's civil war in Ethiopia, civil war in Sudan. You've got a range, you know, the, the coups that have swept across the Sahel uh, conflict in, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. 
you've got Yemen and the whole situation with the Red Sea. So it it looks to me like the institutions of uh, international development and humanitarian response are are really stressed. And I'm not sure if they, I don't see that they have clear strategies for how to respond to the magnitude of the crises. In fact, you uh, DevEx had an article today about the Senate hearing on food security that took place yesterday, I think, or, or the day before, um, which highlighted the, from the U.S. perspective, just the lack of funding to meet the demands just to prevent famine and that it looks you know increasingly likely that there are not um, the institutional actors who are able to step in and and meet those needs and in fact you know also in devex's reporting over the last few weeks you've had articles about you know the amount of retrenchment or um, decreases in funding uh, in UK aid, which has been going on for what three or four years now, that the French are cutting back their development funding, their bilateral funding, that the Germans are cutting back their bilateral funding. Uh, I've seen uh, that the EU is cutting back its funding. So it it looks to me like there's this retrenchment uh, across the development community at a time when the demands are growing and are more acute than they've been in, in 20 years. But w- what do you think about that, Raj or, or Rumbi? I mean, I, I wrote this look ahead piece at the beginning of the year and I hate to be a downer because there are a lot of great things happening in the development space, lots of great innovation and, and success in many corners of the world. But the truth is, I think you laid it out perfectly that we're kind of squeezed uh, from on the one hand, greater need, especially urgent humanitarian need, and on the other, a political environment that just shifted away from us. And, you know, tonight is the State of the Union address. And there's a lot of, of course, predictions about what President Biden might or might not say. But I would predict he's not going to say, hey, here's a lot of new money I'm proposing for global development, you know, because it's just very tough in this political environment to talk about that. And so, you know, as, as you rightly pointed out, you know, our reporting, our, our colleague, Rob Merrick, who's our UK correspondent, you know, was reporting on what the Labour government would do if they uh, end up taking back uh, power in the UK, which looks likely this year. It's one of the only countries that would go kind of from rightward leaning to leftward leaning. But even there, you're not really looking at, you know, big increases in foreign aid. It's more about how they would spend the money. And so I think to your point about the institutions being stressed and USAID kind of in a holding pattern, yeah, I think that's right. And that that needs to change, right? And uh, these are not easy institutions to change, don't get me wrong, but it does feel like how we spend the limited resources is going to be a more important focus this year. Um, in fact, Ruby, you edited a story that Sarah Jurgen put out that's ta- that talks a little bit about what's going on in the pandemic treaty. And it mentions that there's a little bit of a movement among African countries to say, you know, we actually want a new fund. You know, the pandemic fund was set up, but we don't have as much of a voice in it. It's not as big as we need it to be. So we think we ought to create a new fund to fund kind of emergency pandemic response on the continent of Africa. And I read that and I I had to question whether it's realistic in this environment to set up yet another fund. Uh, and go after the same donors to ask for money when, as Patrick says, you know, Germany is cutting, France is cutting, et cetera. So I, I don't know, Ruby, maybe you could tell people a little bit about what that story, you know, says, and I'd love to hear your take on it too. Yeah, that was um, quite an interesting story. Um, this week, Africa CDC sort of laid out what they, actually they did this last week. They laid out their plan or their asks for the pandemic treaty and one of them is exactly that there's this debate going on on whether or not we need a second fund and looking at stretch resources which you've highlighted which patrick has highlighted a lot of people are saying that we don't actually need another fund we don't need to reinvent the wheel let's use what's there but africa cdc has previously criticized the pandemic fund um they are currently not an implementing entity within the pandemic fund and they wish to be an implementing entity. They've applied to be an implementing entity. 
and they've also criticized the amount of vo the voice that African countries have within that fund, and they're saying that we need something else. And there's also the criticism about the pandemic fund not being built for surge financing, which they think um, another fund could um, could could serve better. However, if that's realistic or not, um, I think that's definitely up for debate. But something that I found really interesting within the story is that they also laid out um, a few of their other asks and they highlighted some of the sticking points within the pandemic treaty. As you know, this is supposed to be finalized in May when we go into WHA, but there's still quite a lot of um, sticking points. And one that I found really quite interesting was about the sharing of pathogen data. So African countries want um, a situation where if they share pa pathogen data or genomic sequences during a pandemic with um, companies that will probably develop vaccines or treatments with this um, information, they want a situation where they can share in the benefits of those. And this is probably in response to COVID-19 where African countries were last in line to get vaccines or any kind of treatment. So they are saying that um, this is one of the things that they want included in the treaty. And the last text, which they rejected, um, actually had really strong language around sharing of data on pathogens, but it had less a softer language on the benefits that countries might receive. So that's one of their asks that um, they want. They also want uh, a mention of um, a different pan um, a, another pandemic um, financing instru instrument. And in addition to uh, that as well, they. They are also um, asking for more information on obligations regarding One Health. So One Health looks at how uh, we look at animal health, planetary health, and human health, and how we address that. And they're saying that the language within the treaty right now is not very clear on what um, the requirements will be. And they do not want to sign up for anything that's unclear at the moment because they don't want to increase obligations that they won't be able to meet. That was a great summary. And one of one of the points you made really stuck out at me, Rumbi, because, you know, there's a lot of conversation, and I'm sure, Patrick, you've heard this and been part of these discussions about just how much trust has been broken between the global South and the global North, and that there really is a sense among global South leaders that they're kind of on their own. You know, they look at the trends happening in rich world uh, countries, donor governments, and they see they're really being neglected. Their issues are kind of falling down the priority list. The pandemic's a good example. It's almost as though it never happened. You know, it's just not a priority anymore in so many donor capitals. And so here they are. This is like, to me, a real example of this lack of trust turning into something tangible of the global South saying, okay, well, if this is how it's gonna be, we're gonna play hardball. And we won't share with you uh, information about you know new pathogens when we find them and maybe we'll genetically sequence them and we won't show you the genetic sequence and how do you like that <laughs> you know um, now you might have a global pandemic on your hands that could have been nipped in the bud but we're going to play hardball I mean that's at least how I read it and you can kind of see where they're taking you know where they're coming from on this and so you know I don't know Patrick if you have a thought about that but my feeling is it is a bit of a different moment where the global south is sort of standing up and saying enough is enough yeah, I well, I, I agree with them. I mean, I think that that might be a positive uh, development that we're seeing, which is a more assertive voice from leaders in uh, in the global south who are willing to, as you say, just say, no, we're not going to cooperate on those terms. We need different terms, and if if there are, if we can't have different terms, if if you're not willing to partner with us on more equal terms then you know then there's no basis for a partnership that i think is is a positive development and i think it's a sign of the times of just how different um the geopolitics and the geoeconomics are now than they were 20 years ago when a lot of this machinery and architecture got developed on the on the issue of the funds, I agree with you, Raj. I don't think there's appetite to set up um, new funds. If you just look at the pandemic fund, it hasn't it hasn't been fully funded. It you know it hasn't met its targets. Um, there's the climate global climate fund. It, it is far from meeting its targets and dispersing funds. So the you know the approach of having these global funds to to meet 
transnational needs, which worked, you know, has worked quite successfully with the Global Fund for AIDS and infectious diseases. It, it, it hasn't been very successfully replicated in other sectors. There just doesn't seem to be the political will to, um, to put the financing in on terms that are, you know, where you have governance that is really inclusive governance. So I, I don't see that as, um, as a realistic way forward to address the big issues. And I do think that, you know, global South countries coming together and forming their own partnerships where they have some leverage um, and weight as a counterpart to, you know, to what the U.S. and Europe um, want to see is a positive development. Are you interested in the intersection of business and social impact? Do you want to know how corporate sustainability, ESG, impact investing, and more can contribute to development finance? My name is Adva Saldinger. I'm a senior reporter at DevEx, and I've been reporting on these issues for nearly a decade. I'm the author of DevEx Invested, our free weekly newsletter dedicated to development finance. Every Tuesday, we explore how companies, investors, and market mechanisms are reshaping the world of development finance. Visit devx.com slash newsletters and join us on Tuesdays. Another thing is, while this conversation, you know, I'm, I'm sounding pretty pessimistic, but it may be that um, it's just the time frame in which we're looking at things. Like it's taking time for, for say, the African CDC to really get established, but it's making progress. And um, y- you can see the the whole initiative to manufacture pharmaceuticals in Africa. So they're not dependent on imports and on um, fragile supply chains. That, you know, that is moving along. That that was identified as an important need and it has engendered action and it is, there is progress being made, but it's slow progress. So if we look at, you know, what's happening in the moment, it, it looks you know, like the things are pretty fragile. But um, as you said at the outset of this conversation, there are a lot of positive things that are occurring, but they're going to play out over a much longer time period. Yeah, that's right. And a lot of those are kind of grassroots and local level, small scale. Uh, maybe we can talk about that too in a minute. I mean, a couple of reflections just listening to both of you. You know, one is I've heard some high level people who work on, raising funds for these kinds of vertical funds, you know, the global funds and Gavi's of the world, the pandemic funds of the world. And some, some of them have said to me, look, we're never going to be creating new funds like this that require regular replenishments because it is just so tough to create the political will every two years or three years to go and raise the money that's needed, the billions that are needed. And this is a year in particular, as we've reported, our colleague Jenny Lee Ravello has reported about all the just global health replenishments that are, that are lined up that have to happen in one year, pandemic fund being one of them. So it is a, as a model, it's challenging because you create these cliffs, these funding cliffs, and then you have to go out to governments and you've got to try to get them to, to move. And sometimes they're all trying to you know, ask for money at the very same time. It's very challenging. On the other hand, when you think of the alternatives, like what else are you going to fund? And going back to that USAID article, you know, is it better to just fund a more traditional approach to projects at a bilateral level? You know, have a dozen donor countries all doing their own contracts and grants. Is that better than a multilateral approach that's more rooted around government-based proposals like the Global Fund is? So maybe like the Winston Churchill quote, you know, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. Maybe you could say the same thing about these alliances, um, these these vertical funds, these approaches that that are challenging, but might actually be more effective than the, than the alternatives. And then the last point I hear from people is there's a real tension, not just in terms of whether or not you create new funds, but how you run them. And there's a real debate, and it's seen in this piece that Romy is talking about, you know, the pandemic fund is hosted at the World Bank. The new loss and damage fund that came out of the COP 
that's hosted at the World Bank. And there's been a lot of debate about that. And you can see some of the debate is, well, how much voice do individual Global South countries have in this? But in a way, when you give them less voice, you might attract more Global North donor funding because those donors, they want more control over the money. So there's a little bit of a tension there. And, and if you take it out of the World Bank or you make it, you know, like the WHO with hundreds of member states who have votes, you know, you might create more of a bureaucracy, more overhead, a slower moving beast than if you use the institutions that already exist. So I think it's a fascinating dynamic and debate that I hear playing out all the time. Yeah. I, I mean, you're touching on the political aspect of it. Um, and I, I don't think that from the major Western donor governments that there's going to be an upswelling of political will to fund uh, these, you know, inclusive global mechanisms because governments or nations are going to see it as in their interest to have more control over the funds. And, you know, as you know, and as DevEx has reported, that issue of governance, governance of the multilateral financial institutions, in particular the World Bank, is, you know, that's at the heart of the whole conversation about reform of the MFIs. I'm actually concerned that, you know, as we see this shift in the dynamic that that is... Um, you know, in part created by all these disturbances in the world and by the scale and scope of those disturbances and who's involved in them, that we're going to see um, development assistance especially, including global uh, assistance for global health, but also humanitarian assistance to, to some extent, more and become more and more transactional. And um, I don't know, do you... Do you see that? Yeah, you mean kind of going back to sort of the worst aspects of the Cold War, right? When it yes, was yes, that's exactly what I mean, right? <laughs> and because it does feel, in a way, like we're entering that era. You know, there's a, a bifurcation. You know, the world is not so unipolar anymore. Obviously, the U.S. or Western, Western and China uh, conflict uh, competition, at least, is very uh, prominent in the world today. Clearly, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has set up another axis there. And yeah, I think you're right. We could we could go back to a point where countries are thinking for their national security interests, their energy security interests, their economic interests to go do deals. You know, all right, we'll give you this humanitarian money, but that's because we want something for it. And you know, diplomatic or relationship with military, we want something. And it feels to me like you can see in the short run good arguments for that. It's one way to raise funds out of Congress or out of the British Parliament or the European Parliament. But in the long run. Does this really lead to good development? <laughs> you know, I don't know. Um, you know, does this actually, like when we think of what development really is, and, you know, does this get us there? So it's, right. it's a really challenging moment. Yeah, and it's not only, you know, who uh, receives the funds, it's who, who doesn't. Like, it's hard for me to imagine that there's much sympathy in the U.S. right now for providing humanitarian assistance to Yemen. Um, so it's it, it it will go both ways in terms of the kinds of transactions. It, and, and I feel like we're at a time where we're going to move more in that direction. Yeah, it it certainly feels like that. And obviously, a lot depends on this year's elections. But you know, and elections can go you know in unexpected ways. But you know, if we were to end up with another Trump administration, that really scrambles a lot. You know, because suddenly proposals on the hill from sort of fringe characters that seem really out there and outlandish, those could be real negotiating positions. You know, things like cutting USAID in half, eliminating agencies, those could become real negotiating positions. Or, you know, if you look at the European Parliament elections and depending how right-leaning some of these countries get, you already mentioned France and Germany. Of course, the Netherlands had a big election. Sweden has been cutting back. So this is a global trend. And uh, no doubt it's a, it's a really challenging one including for institutions, maybe as a quick segue to the Africans, you know, the Africa CDC, which depend on these inter international donors. Uh, Ruby, we had another story about Africa CDC this week that maybe you can tell our listeners about uh, related to the deputy director general and that position. 
Yeah, an interesting story coming out of Africa CDC. Not entirely surprising, but interesting nonetheless. The acting Deputy Director General, Dr. Ahmed Ogwal, will be resigning at the end of this month. So our global health reporter, Sarah Jerving, broke that story this week. And um, um, interestingly enough, um, Dr. Ahmed has been with Africa CDC since 2019. He was the first um, Deputy Director for Africa CDC. And he also served as the acting director after Dr. Nkinga Song left the organization for PEPFAR. And he applied for the role of um, director general, but did not make the short list. So when Dr. Kaseya was appointed um, in April, he continued on as acting um, deputy director general. And um, unfortunately, there was an announcement made about uh, the position, which is still. Um, open for applications and it was highlighted that only a certain uh, only applicants from certain countries 32 african countries could apply because um, of quarters within the um, african um, african union system and we were told by a spokesperson that currently the quotas for directors for directors from east africa have been filled within africa cdc so Dr. Ahmed did not have the choice of applying. We're also told that he was offered a different position within Africa CDC, but he declined that. And interesting enough, I think um, 10 minutes ago, we published a news story. Today, Kasea announced the appointment of a long-time staffer, Dr. Raji Tajadin, who's from Nigeria, who served as head of public health institutes and research. Uh, will be acting um, director, deputy director general until they make an appointment. Interesting. Yeah, I actually got a chance to um, to sit down with Dr. Ahmed. Uh, let's see, not at this last UNGA, but maybe the one before that. And, you know, when I asked him about would he be a candidate to be the director general, he had a twinkle in his eye. I think he really wanted it. And it shows that, you know, these international institutions, they even regional ones, they are also, you know, dependent on the kind of politics that are really uh, in the fore now, as, uh, as Patrick, you said, right, that they're, in the end, the idea that somebody might not get a job just based on their nationality, it's one of the things, one of the features of the UN system, of many of the UN agencies, of many of the multilateral agencies that a lot of people look at and say, well, this is partly why these groups don't run that well. I mean, it's why you get political support for them, of course, you have to build a coalition. And you couldn't have, you know, everybody from one country or just too much of an imbalance. But it doesn't feel like a meritocracy or an organization that's built for its mission when it's so dependent on nationality uh, to determine who leads it. And again, not just for Africa CDC, this applies to lots of other multilateral institutions in our space. Yeah, I w you know, it's no different from the UN, as you point out, Raj. And you hear the same kind of criticism and complaint from the UN uh, around certain hiring decisions because of the quotas. But, you know, on the other hand, it does provide for a certain inclusiveness, which I think is, is a high value uh, in Africa to see that, you know, the, the big powerful countries are not the ones who dominate the senior positions. Otherwise, you know, you'd have a lot of South Africans and Nigerians and, Kenyans um, in in the top positions, so so you're right. There's a tension there, and there's pros and cons on both sides. But I think it's important also to to recognize why uh, an institution like well AU African Union institutions um, want to ensure that there's um, participation at senior levels from across the continent. Yeah, it does make a lot of sense. I mean, maybe one last story because we're running out of time that we could get into, uh, because we've talked a lot about sort of the politics of the global north, the donor countries. But, you know, there's also similar politics happening in the global south. You know, rising populism and even authoritarianism is not something that we're just seeing in Western Europe. Um, you know, so it, it's going everywhere. And one example, a story that we published this week is about Bangladesh. Um, and it, I think it points to a really interesting tension in our space, which is Bangladesh has been one of the great economic development success stories of the last couple of decades. Uh, but they have a leader in Sheikh Hasina who's been there now in her fourth term. They just had elections, I think, January 7th, and she won again. 
And one of her arch enemies, it turns out, is the famous Nobel Prize winning, you know, microfinance leader, Mohammed Yunus. And uh, it looks like he has a real chance of going to jail. And so we had a piece about that. I don't know, maybe Rumbi, you want to say a word about that story? And I'd love to hear uh, your, your take on this broader trend, Patrick. So this is um, a must read for anyone who hasn't read this story. It reads like a movie, which is, uh, I think, quite rare in our space. Um, Muhammad Yunus is facing jail time. Um, and this is for uh, flouting labor laws in, Bla in Bangladesh. But obviously, his supporters um, say that the charges are trumped up. This is a political ploy. And this all has to do with his rivalry. And I think um, this also, uh, as you pointed out, uh, where Bangladesh stands, but this also points to a very interesting trend, as you're saying, in the global south. I think we always have these um, shining lights in the global south. I think Ethiopia was one. And what happens when um, de democracy sort of goes downhill within those um, countries? And how do um, other donor countries react to that? Well, I just in in terms of um, Mohammed Yunus in particular, uh, Sheikh Hasina has been going after him for you know like twelve years. I I recall when I was in government and uh, Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, she made a very direct intervention to uh, assist Mohammed Yunus so that he wouldn't face charges. So that you know this is a long standing rivalry or animosity that that um exists and it it looks like it is you know finally coming to a point where where the ruling party in bangladesh is going to put this person who they see as an antagonist be be able to actually uh put him in jail which you know seems uh like a shame given given that he's not a, a, an active political actor and that he, you know, he is a sincere uh, agent for positive change. Um, but it is, that's, it's, it's not new. Yeah, one of the people we interviewed in the piece says that she's worried that he could become the next Navalny, you know, talking about Alexei Navalny there. I think he's 81 years old. Uh, the idea that he would go to prison for years now, it's kind of shocking to people who have followed his career. And I think it does raise kind of two interesting questions from my mind that get, get into some of the themes we've been discussing today. You know, one is what is the dynamic between countries that are really well governed and run and have great economic policies and are growing but maybe at the same time are not so good when it comes to being an open society, freedom of the press, human rights, and kind of how does the global development community grapple with that? Because historically, you know, most of the global development community comes from Western democracies and, you know, a lot of the funding comes from Western democracies and they tend to look at these countries and say, well, no, you should be able to do both things. You should be an open democratic society and have great economic growth. But you look at some of the, the donor darlings, as they're called, and Rumbi, you, you mentioned Ethiopia, you can think of Rwanda, you can think of Bangladesh, you know, many of the countries that are doing the best uh, in terms of economic growth may not be doing so well in these other key factors uh, at a time when the whole world is doing worse on those key governance factors and, and democratic factors. So I think that's one really interesting trend that Bangladesh raises, raises up for people. And then the second one, there's a, a, a part of the story that talks about how it's very possible Muhammad Yunus will become a quote, quote unquote bargaining chip being used by Bangladesh because Bangladesh is trying to assert its independence from Western influence and maybe cozy up with China. And so the geopolitical story we talked about earlier, Patrick, like it's playing out right here, right now, maybe with you know one of the most famous people in our space, um, you know, losing his freedom over it. Um, I think that you know those those trends or those dynamics that you're describing is, in my mind, those are factors that will cause uh, Western governments, the U.S. and and European governments, to move towards a more transactional uh, kind of relationships with with countries where, and you even see it during the, during here in the U.S. 
You see it in the Biden administration de-emphasizing or putting less stress on some of the moral or, you know, our, our perceived moral or ethical stances and more on uh, just building working relationships with countries uh, to address common problems or, or yeah, or, and challenges uh, like climate change, for example. So I I think it's part of this sign of the times. I think it's just really unfortunate that somebody like Mohammed Yunus, who's contributed so much to global well-being, and is you know it, it, it's hard to conceive of him as a as a threat, um, but that he should, for you know, for uh, personal reasons, um, be a victim to uh, to authoritarian forces. If you if you listen to what one of our presidential candidates is saying, that you know about um, vengeance and going after his political opponents, it does feel like it it you know, maybe a, a larger trend, just like a meanness, a meanness in the world. The world is more mean. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And it's, it's a frightening trend if it is one, but it does feel like, like this moment um, is a moment where authoritarians are on the upswing. You know, it, it, we'll see how these elections go this year. It's not, it's not a foregone conclusion. And there are lots of people, including in this community, that are working really hard to ensure human rights and democratic principles are upheld. So uh, let's like wish them Godspeed. Uh, it's been great to talk to both of you. It's been a fantastic and busy news week as, as listeners can tell, and there's lots more to come next week. So I just invite everybody to stay tuned for our next episode of This Week in Global Development. If you've liked hearing about these stories, of course, subscribe to the DevX Newswire, our free daily newsletter that gets into all the great reporting that we're doing from all over the world. And uh, thanks again for listening in. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Rumby. It's been great to talk to you. This has been This Week in Global Development. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe using the link in the description. To get even more coverage and analysis on the most pressing development issues of the day, become a DevX Pro member by going to devx.com slash membership and signing up. Thank you for listening and see you next week.